David and Goliath. The story in the Bible got to do with this. And what is the implication for the developing and developed nations? And, and I think the inspiration, the thing that stands between inspiration and performance and success is self-confidence in between. And your ability to think that you can achieve it. That's the most important thing that is often a barrier. And I thought this story will be really good for the youngsters. Because all of us think that we are living in one single planet, the planet Earth. But actually, this is two different planets, completely different. The planet of the developed world and the planet of the developing world. Or if we have to put it in another sense of the term, it is the planet of the haves and the planet of the have-nots. Because if you see here, it is completely shocking, the difference. You can see in the US and Canada and the North America, the per capita income per year is around $66,000. And if you see some of the countries, it is only $267 per year. I mean, the difference is something enormous, like 180 to 240 times. So it is not two equal worlds or not two equal planets. You can see that the difference is very huge. And when there is so much discrepancy and lack of wealth and poverty, many things are lost. Now we think uh, we always talk about health, we talk about many different things. But one thing that we don't realize is that this poverty actually snatches the opportunity for doing research and also doing being innovative. And in this era of where the power is with knowledge, I mean, the current phrase is knowledge is power. It is not the money you have because we see every decade brings new billionaires and they are not the traditionally rich people. They all become billionaires by their knowledge, their innovative power and their original thinking power. And in this era of knowledge and information, leadership, especially professional leadership, no longer comes from just knowledge propagation. It is not by doing more number of cases or it is not by doing, giving more lectures. Because whatever you can do, after you leave, there is no legacy behind. And there will be somebody else to give more number of anesthesias and somebody to do more number of surgeries. So that's not going to give you permanent leadership. So leadership actually comes from knowledge creation and innovations. And a young mind, a young doctor, might feel diffident thinking of the big research institutes all around the world and feel difficult or diffident that he may not be able to do. And that is the reason I thought that this parable in Bible has a lot of relevance for us. Now, for those of you who do not know the story of David and Goliath, now this was a time in the 11th century BC where there is a constant fight between the Philistines and the Israelites of those days. And there was a fight and King Saul was unable to have a victory because the Philistines had come to make war against King Saul. And they had a warrior, Goliath, who was probably had a hormonal deficiency or who had a hormonal problem. And he was nine feet, six inches tall, a giant by any standards of time. And he was also very powerful and his arm reach was so high that there was no warrior who could go nearby to slay him because even before they reached him, he was slain because of his arm span. And Goliath came forth day by day and challenged King Saul and the Israels for a single combat. And this was a big problem for King Saul because none of his warriors were ready for a single combat. They for sure knew what will be the outcome and nobody were willing to go. And it looked like the kingdom was going to be lost because there was no people to take over. And so King Saul made a public announcement that whoever goes and wins Goliath will be eligible to marry his third daughter. And also, the, and that was, but still there was no buddy there. And surprisingly, there was an offer from David who was a simple shepherd. And you might wonder what David, but David was all the time protecting his sheep in the forest from wild bees. 
and his armor was just a sling and stones and with it he could actually chase away all the wild beast who would come to prey upon his small lamp and when david offered himself to go and fight against goliath i mean everybody was diffident his two brothers and everybody everybody said no even king saul said no and then when there was no other offer he was allowed to go and god king saul gave him his personal armor and the shield which david refused and then went into the uh, warhead the next day now this is the place when when goliath saw it was just david who has come he was so infuriated i mean he was so angry he thought he has been insulted by sending a shepherd rather than a warrior and in his infuriation he just let down his combat caution to the winds and rushed towards david and david had collected these pebbles from the river bed and these he put into the sling and then with the greatest force and his greatest accuracy he was able to hit the goliath on his forehead much before even goliath could reach him and this pebble went straight into his skull and he fell down and after that he was able to go and slay the head of uh, goliath now what is the relevance over here now i don't think we should take this as just a story because it is told in many different contexts in various places i think we can take this as a circumstance where a small weaker but an innovative and courageous person is pitted against the larger more stronger and seemingly overpowering person but held what we can call in one single term as the underdog but still comes out very successfully and we need to think what gave david his victory and what we can learn from it now the first and foremost thing david was not upright he was self confident he was not out by the size and magnitude of his adversary secondly he knew his strength and he used it to his best advantage third he did not try to ape his foe he did not accept his king's armor and sword and rather he brought a element of surprise into the war by bringing the shepherd's rules to the battlefield and didn't play by goliath's rules he knew his strength and he used his advantage so the story is not about a shepherd and a giant it is actually about believing in oneself it is in belief of a greater power because david felt that his supreme god who actually saved him from him and his lamp from all the wild beasts in the forest would also save him from goliath and that gave him an enormous amount of confidence and not being awed and feel be little by the mighty because he thought his skill and god was much bigger than them and he used his native skill with ingenuity now i think these four or five important things we can take it to many battle grounds which we face in our life now let's take what is relevant to all of us the battle ground for global professional supremacy now every single doctor when he enters the field i think if you ask him what do you want to be at 50 or what do you want to be when you are retiring i am sure that they would always say i want to be very famous i want to leave a legacy behind where my name will be made for out but if you have to do that then you have to have a supremacy but supremacy comes from research and unfortunately or fortunately in this present period of time research needs lots of things it needs infrastructure it needs lot of research funds and you need technology and you need expertise and in the places and institutions where we work we often may find that the research centers and big institutions from the rest of the world is when we compare to what we have we are clearly outsized and we feel very little and this may actually make us very diffident so diffident and lack of confidence that we may not even take the first step of getting into this problem this is actually true because when i searched in the net last night you find that the world bank statistics 2021 and based on r&d and research expenditures 
A few countries performed the most global R&D. In 2019, the United States, it actually spends 27% of global funds which are for world research. That is 656 billion. And China is 526 billion. I mean, if you put together, it will be more than the GDP and budget of nearly 50% of the countries worldwide. And so it is not surprising that 90% of new knowledge, innovations, and patents come from just 10% of the countries. And 90% of the rest of the countries just look up to them. I'm just giving this data, which I took from, and these are all orthopedics. Now you will find that if you look at the research impact of nations and coming from the best of the premium orthopedic journal, India's contribution is less than 1% in most of them. And this is really surprising. And it, it is not something that we can be, this is a statistics which we cannot be proud about. So we are blindly following the tune of outside evidence. And is that okay? It's certainly not okay for many reasons. Because when the solution comes from a developing world or a developed world, the problem is that we are talking about something completely different. Now let's look at these two people at the top and compare to the two people at the bottom. And if we think on medical parlance, what is the difference between them? We have to say that in one single word, if you can mention, it is the word everything. Everything is different between them. The diseases they get is different. The treatment that is available to them is different. The infrastructure available, the provider of cost, affordability, and even the expectations that they have out of treatment is completely different. So when everything else is different, the solution cannot be the same. And imported solutions also have the problem that they are either not available or not affordable. It escalates the cord cost for the needy, often making it unaffordable, and it is a profit to the business world. Now, again, forgive me for taking an orthopedic example, but let's look at what happened to the epidemic of mechanical low back pain in the last two decades. Now, we all know that this is the most common musculoskeletal problem. Almost 80% of people have a lifetime prevalence, and at least 20% of the world population go through a patch where they have very severe back pain. Nothing, not a disease, but it's just a symptom. And they have minor changes in MRI. Now, if this is remaining as a symptom, then there is no problem. When there is no problem, there is no profit. So many of the Western world try to create this, convert the symptom into a disease. And when you convert it into a disease, you can offer a therapy, which actually is a profit. So if you look at a mild degenerative disc, which everybody has, and MRI helped to show to the patient that they have something like a gray hair, there is nothing that the world did not do to the disc. I mean, we tried to suck it out, we put electrotherapy, we heated it, we put enzymes inside, we put growth factors inside, all at a very high cost. And at the end of many types of interventions, patients were just the same. And Many of the studies actually prove that the outcome was no better than conservative treatment. But what happens is that it escalated the cost of low back pain treatment so high that if you take these solutions to India or a developing country, you can be sure that we would be bankrupt in no point of time. So 818% increase over there. We also need to be aware that as it is published in JAMA, that when you have new innovations, we have to find that there are only potential contribution, important contribution to existing therapies, you have only 3%. Whereas 84% of new introductions and new innovations have little or no potential contribution to existing therapies. So they all come into the market, and this is what is called the Scott's parabola. Just like you have a natural history of a disease, we now have a natural history for new innovations, inventions, and new technologies and new techniques. You find that it always is introduced as a promising data in a peer-reviewed journal. Probably then everybody starts using it. Positive reports come, a lot of enthusiasm implemented, and it becomes the standard of care. And after a few years, 
Many problems are reported, rejected by experts, and not used by veterans, and it just goes down. Now, this is the natural history. Now, if we import the data from that and blindly follow all the 100% of recommendations, this is exactly what we will do. We'll go through the red circle of parabola, and that will be a problem. A good example, again, is the story of steroids for spinal cord injury. Now, in the JAMA, which is one of the most highly uh, indexed journals, this was reported as the efficacy of methylprednisolone in acute con injuries. Then, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which we hold in the highest preamble, this again was said that it is really good. And again, another one in JAMA. Now, all these three were from the same group of investigators and they advocated that every spinal cord injury must have a very high dose of methylprednisolone. A dose so high that it has not been used in any other medical uh, disease. But then millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars worth of methylprednisolone was sold. But then after three clinical trials, six cohort studies, 12 larger animal publications were studied. They found that methylprednisolone had no use whatever in spinal cord injury, whereas it increased the mortality and morbidity and infection rates in these patients six times. But by the time, almost $28 million of methylprednisolone had been sold. They also went into the first initial publications and found there was a lot of issues in how the statistics was done and the research was done. So we have a responsibility to our patients that we need to do and get data from ourselves. If 90% of the disease burden is in the developing countries, then leadership must happen only over here. So that brings us to the question, why is it not happening? Why is all the research coming from abroad and why we are not the leaders of the medical? So it is not knowing our strength. I think that is the first main thing and not having the self-confidence and the collaboration that is expected for this. So if you look at David, he was not afraid. That means he was self-confident. He did know what is his strength and he did not try to imitate the Western world. And he brought his rules to the game and did not adopt the other game. So if we learn this, then the next question that comes to our mind is, what will be our stones of strength? What is the pebble that I think that we should take for our thing? And I think that the first and foremost thing that we should do is to think differently. Actually, it is not thinking differently about something else. I think we should think differently about ourselves first how we look at ourselves, and what is our strength. Now, traditionally, this high clinical load is thought to be a great disadvantage for all of us. And we also have this as an advantage, pure pathology, and low cost of research. These three are three great things which can actually armor us. But if you ask any of the prominent clinicians why they are not doing research, the first and foremost thing that they would say my clinical load is so much, I have no time for research. I am so fatigued, I am so tired, it is. But we know that time is how we use it. The only thing that the beggar on the street in India has as much, not more, not less, as the President of the United States is 24 hours of the day. The American President Biden cannot say, I am the President of the United States, I need a few more hours every day. It's not possible. So it is only how a use it matters. And so this high clinical load, we have to look at it differently. Now, Goliath was a giant, and King Saul thought that Goliath was too big to fight. But actually, David thought that he was too big to miss. You know, that is the fundamental difference in which the way you look at a disadvantage. And this we have also found in the population problem in India. When we were students and we were young doctors, people always said India cannot improve very fast because it cannot be a major thing because 1.3 billion population. We only looked at this 1.3 billion as 1.3 billion mouths to feed. And that is the way King Saul would have thought. 
But if you are David, and this is what has happened in the last one decade, this 1.3 billion population was thought to be like, if you have 1.3 billion mouths to feed, then you have 2.6 billion hands to work. Now, once you think in that line, then you also thought of this as youth power. Then we thought of 1.5 billion workforce, buying power, and the world started looking at India as a huge market, and that brought India to the forefront. So our high clinical load, we should not think of it as a disadvantage. Actually, we should convert it to a huge advantage of the power of clinical research. And this will put us in the leadership of the world, and this is what we have been doing in Ganga Hospital. So the second pebble would actually be that we have to harness on the power of clinical research. This should be an impartial clinical research, and we should create our own data and conclusions. Because you will see that more than 50% of what is written in traditional textbooks is without sound proof, be it on diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure, and many chronic diseases. And many of these RCTs are fa fa funded by the pharmacy and device industry. And virtually all of them support the drug or the product. Now, look at this. A simple burst fracture, which is the most common thing which a spine surgeon treats. There are so many different ways it is treated around the world without a clear knowledge of what is really good. If you look into the literature, it becomes very obvious that how you treat this fracture around the world or how this fracture gets treated around the world is not fracture dependent, is not evidence dependent, but mainly surgeon dependent. In some of the Western world, if you have a fracture, you get a double surgery. You get a posterior surgery and then you get an anterior surgery and the cost of this implant placed over here is into many thousands of dollars. Now, this is scarcely affordable for India. And in few years before, we did in 2014, we published this, which actually changed the entire concept. We proved by just adding two additional screws at the fractured uh, site. It became so biomechanically strong that we did not need an anterior surgery. We did not need any costly implants. And the results were completely as good or much safer than doing the most complicated surgery. That actually proves that in research, an inquisitive mind, observations, and analysis can be very sufficient. Now, this is actually the three things that actually also put us on top in the trauma world. Now, if you have an injury like this, you know that 50% chance is there for you to get a poor result. And more important, the Western world was not very greatly interested in this because insurance clearance for salvage was very difficult. Because they had some statistics that amputation was less costlier and giving a good prosthesis was much easier. So I remember that in, 2000, in nine, uh, 2004, I presented a paper on distal finger and toes replantation. And I was thinking that there will be a lot of appreciation, whereas the moderator in the United States actually said that he is not very sure that what I talked was really good because he was not sure of what is the economical worth of a single finger. So my reply to him was, it depends upon whose finger, isn't it? I mean, if that cannot be decided by the, this thing. Actually, there was a huge crowd. It was in Chicago. And when he asked me, do you think that this is economically important? So I said, it depends upon whose finger. I said, if it is my, if it is your finger, I will go by insurance. But if it is my finger, I will get it sorted out and amplished. And I said, if it is my daughter's finger, it is 10 times more valuable to me than even if it is my own finger. There was a huge collapse and people, and then the moderator became completely red-faced. Now, the other problem was that these were so different, this amount of injuries. There was so much of variability, there was no common method of knowing who should be salvaged and by what method. Now, that was why in 2004, after a lot of clinical study, absolutely no rocket science, just observation, good documentation, simple statistical analysis, we were able to uh, uh, evolve the Gungo Hospital Open Injury Severity Score for salvage and function. 
and now this is a standard score used worldwide, uh, quoted in every single orthopedic book, and this is true. It also got us the uh, uh, invited editorial review from Injury on the philosophy of care of open injury based on the Ganga Hospital score. And on this, we were able to make many important innovations and new techniques of staining where primary closure of open injury, which was considered to be a taboo in the world before, we were able to show very clearly how to do it, who are the people to be managed and how, and we were able to save thousands of uh, limbs which would have otherwise gone for amputation. So it just goes to show that by good observation, documentation, inquisitive mind, and good data analysis, we should not be just stagnant as doctors, but we should convert ourselves to doctor scientists. And this is very, very possible. So we don't need a doctor science, I mean rocket science. Good clinical research is invaluable. And in the last 20 years, we have had more than 850. In fact, last year we crossed the 1,000th international peer-reviewed publication from the hospital. And we have more than 175 chapters in uh, textbooks. So we need to actually believe in ourselves. And we need to innovate. So we need to get off this compulsive drive of whenever you have a problem, just to open your iPhone and look into what others have published. I mean, we need to do a good clinical audit. And then think of solutions for ourselves. And then try to come out with this thing. You would actually find in orthopedics or in spine surgery, whenever there is a problem, they will discuss as the French school of thought, the Japanese school of thought, the German school of thought, the English school of thought. But very rarely it is spoken as the Indian school of thought. And that's because for anything and everything, our compulsive disorder is to just go into the net and see what he has said, what he has said, what somebody has said, but we don't think what we should do. I'll just close with this uh, uh, example for belief in ourselves. Every single talk, I always put something about Arvind Hospital because it is so inspiring for us. Now, this is a story of the Oro Lab. So in the early 90s, India was the home to the largest number of uh, cataract blind. And the prohibitive price for Aravind Hospital to do a large number of surgeries was the price of the IOLs, which costed more than $100. Now, when Dr. Venkatasamy saw this as the problem, he decided to manufacture it locally. When everybody said, no, it is not possible, he set up the Oro Lab. And this, he created a good quality lens absolutely same quality as imported lens for just two dollars per lens and then he marketed it at six dollars per lens to the outside world and for the camp patients they were given completely free of charge now you can see that it completely revolutionized because now you can see they are producing 12,000 lenses a day which means every day they are giving vision to 12,000 patients would have otherwise gone blind. So this is a really good setting that whenever you have a problem, whenever you are faced with an issue, you need to come up with the solution and try to do it ourselves. In fact, in orthopedics also, it is really wondering because there is a lot of robotic solutions that are computer navigations. And when you travel to their factories in Germany or France, you find that they are all completely masterminded by Indian uh, engineers over there. It just needs a fermentation or a catalyst that these people should come and then do it. Over here it will be. So if you, this uh, story of Varavind Hospital is always the story that if you believe you can win, then of course you can win provided you work hard for it. So in the research in 2004, we wanted to make the next big jump. And apart from clinical research, we set up the Ganga Orthopedic Research Center, started as a small building and started as a small group. And with this team, there was no big, uh, huge investment or anything, but just adopting the same policy of ask a question, look for a solution within yourself and try to do good analytical methods. We were able to amass a huge number of international awards. 
where in every single international competition, people started asking, what is the paper coming from Ganga Hospital? Now, the Easels Award is supposed to be like the Wimbledon of tennis. So we were able to win it four times, the Euro Spine Award, Asia Pacific Spine Award twice, Seacott Award. And for the last three years consecutively, we have been able to win the North American Spine Society Research Award. It's a hat. -trick. Now, this was, this gave us a big impetus that we should now take the Western world on the grounds of molecular research. And in 2021, aided by the Department of Biotechnology, we have set up a new building with a state-of-the-art molecular research where we can do proteomics, genomics, molecular microbiology, and bioinformatics. We have four PhDs uh, and six MPhils in biotechnology working there. And we are looking at high-quality research on what is the molecular basis of early disc degeneration. So we need to be a part of the solution. And then uh, I was just thinking that, OK, we are talking so much. and. Uh, what is the relevance to God? So I have not even discussed this with Bala because I just decided this only when I was doing the slides half an hour ago, the last three slides, that we need to make the theme relevant for God also. So with Bala's permission, we would just establish a GARC Research Award for the best research done by anybody in the field of anesthesia in the country and the GARC Publication Award. We have, I set up this publication award in the Association of Spine Surgeons of India, where there is a numerical value given upon the impact factor of the journal published. And the person with the highest impact of research gets an award uh, every year. So we can establish this in anesthesia also, and we can honor that person every year. And the best research award will be done. And these two awards, I'm happy to say that it will come from the Ganga Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation without having any major history. Age, category, from which institution it comes, nothing matters. Because we want it to be based on meritocracy. And Bala will, will sit down and form uh, rules and regulations for this, and it will be announced to you. So as our prime minister said, a nation's ultimate strength depends upon what it can do on its own and not what it can borrow from others. So always this need not intimidate us. There is a possibility that you can rise up to the occasion and form a challenge. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank